God bless you. Hello, welcome. I am Robert Stearns coming to you live from the Tabernacle in Buffalo, New York. And we have just been inundated with requests for education, for information, for perspective in light of everything that's happening in Israel. As you know, we were there with a group of 300 from 22 nations. We were leading uh, our annual tour around the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem that we started with Pastor Jack Hayford in 2004. And just as our group uh, got back to the airport to head back to the U.S. and to these other 21 nations that they had come from, uh, we began to hear the sirens, we began to hear the first attacks. Um, my sons and I were planning on staying an extra three days to do some filming, to do some teaching, some video work, and so we were there stuck in the middle of the conflict for several days. But um, literally on social media, our office, we've been overwhelmed with requests for education, for perspective, and there's a part of me that just feels like, uh, <laughs> folks, for 25 years, for 30 years, we have been blowing the trumpet, calling the church to attention on what is happening with the Jewish people, with Israel, with the Palestinians, with the Middle East, and now, indeed, the attention of the world is focused there. The strongest resource I can give you immediately is for you to link and purchase our Watchman on the Wall course. Pastor Jack Hayford and I wrote this uh, with the assistance of a wonderful lady named Rodlin Park. Um, this curriculum has been translated into 11 languages around the world. It's there available in the link right now. If you're trying to understand, if you're trying to wrap your brain around all of this, both spiritually and geopolitically, this is the best reference that I can direct you to right away that's available to you. Order it, we can get it into your hands within days. All of the information is there. But this uh, is going to give you an understanding of the current conflict. So what we're gonna do over the next six weeks, these are gonna be short 30 minute um, classes, teachings that we're gonna bring that will hopefully help distill the information for you and give you the empowerment that you need. And so in fact, even driving here tonight uh, on the news, I saw coming here tonight, there were uh, random strangers, anti-Semites, walking up to Jewish homes, uh, ringing a doorbell, and you know, people have these video doorbells now, the ring system, etc. cetera. And uh, the woman said, yes, can I help you? And this individual started screaming out, I will not repeat it, but just swearing and screaming out horrible, horrible threats against this Jewish family. Uh, right now in Germany, they are drawing stars of David on the homes of Jewish people, just like they did in the times of Hitler. Uh, Jewish businesses are being threatened. Jewish students in universities across America right now are under threat. And so the church must mobilize. There are, there are areas that we can dialogue, we can compromise, we can try to understand, we can seek to find compromise. And then there's a time that you have to call evil for what it is, evil. And you cannot be silent, you cannot equivocate. The Bible says if the watchman sees the danger approaching and the watchman does not sound the trumpet, then the blood of the city will be on the head of the watchman. We are here tonight blowing the trumpet to the church. Wake up, confront evil, and speak out loud. And part of the way you do that, a major way to do that, is to have the facts. And so tonight, we want to bring you some facts. So the first thing that I want to say, folks, is that this situation is complicated. This is a, a, a warfare, a battle that goes back not years, not decades, it goes back millennia. And so we have to understand that to wrap your brain around this, you've got to, you've got to strap yourself in for the long haul. This is not a quick fix. This is not something you can study for 10 minutes and understand. Um, to unpack this is going to take time. Now, let me contradict what I just said. All right, I'm going to contradict myself. I do that regularly, but let me do it again. It's also a very easy conflict to understand. Let me simplify it for you. If the Palestinians put down their arms, put down their weapons, if Hamas, the Palestinians, the Intifadas, the uprisings, if they put down their weapons and 
seriously engaged for peace for Israel, there would be a solution relatively immediately. If the Jews and Israel put down their weapons, put down their uh, arms, there would be no more Israel. There would be no more Jewish state. That is the reality of the situation. Since the beginning, Israel is looking for peace, open to peace, working for peace, looking for a cessation of violence, but has been met with nothing but attack. Golda Meir said it this way, you can't negotiate with people who have come to kill you. Let that sink in. You cannot negotiate with people who have come to kill you. So this is what Israel is facing. All right, we have, we're going to start unpacking some of the complication of this. What we have simultaneously on one hand is a religious war. We have a religious war that's being fought and we have a territorial war that is being fought. These are two separate realities that are both happening simultaneously. And that greatly confuses the situation. It greatly complicates the situation. There is a religious war that is being fought against Israel by radical Islam. This is being fueled mostly by Iran, but also by other factions. And so this manifests in groups like Hamas and groups like Hezbollah. So the religious war is not seeking the creation of a Palestinian state, is not seeking peace in the Middle East, is not seeking can't we find a way for coexistence, the religious war is dedicated to the destruction first of what they call the little Satan, Israel, and then the destruction of the big Satan, America and the West. This is a global jihad. It is a global, uh, well-planned, well-thought-out, well-financed attack that comes from radical Islam. I wrote about this in my book, No, We Can't. Militant secularism, radical Islam, and the myth of coexistence. And so you cannot negotiate, you cannot uh, compromise with a system that is dedicated to your destruction. The Hamas charter calls for the destruction of the state of Israel and the extermination of the Jewish people. You can't negotiate with that. You can't debate with that. You can't compromise with that. That is the religious side of this conflict. Now, there's a territorial side of this conflict. What is that? That is the reality of the Palestinian people. The reality of the Palestinians who are living in a in-between limbo state since the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. What are we going to do with the Palestinian people? They deserve to live in peace. They deserve to live in prosperity. They deserve the right towards self-determination. How do we care and work for the human rights and dignity of the Palestinian people? God is concerned with the Palestinian people. He loves them. Jesus loves the Palestinian people. Christians love the Palestinian people. So how do we work for them to have a future and a hope? This is the territorial conflict that is going on. However, these two realities become enmeshed together because the legitimate desire of the Palestinian people for a place of peace and prosperity and a future becomes a tool that the religious war uses to not have peace. Because the religious war is not interested in peace, it's interested in destruction. So the longer they cannot have peace, the more this group can be radicalized, disappointed, uh, 
uh, brainwashed through the school systems, the more this group can advance its aims. Let's take a look at what that looks like in a reality on the map. Can we put up the map of uh, Israel and the surrounding areas, that first map that we have? We'll get that map up there in a moment. Uh, the other one, the other map, please. So as we get to, there we go. So we have here Israel in yellow. Here is Gaza, okay? Gaza is this small area on the Mediterranean. You notice it shares a border with Egypt and with Israel. So there is a border with Egypt. Let's remember that Egypt, what? Arab, Muslim, some Christians, same language, same culture. All of that here in this massive, massive country of Egypt. Then here you have Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank. But biblically, this is Judea and Samaria. So this area here of light purple and this area here is the area where the Palestinians uh, are currently living. So now we come to this other reason for complication. Why is this complicated? The question of demographics. Demogra There's no L in demographics. Demographics. The question of demographics. Let's unpack this question of demographics. Israel has been persecuted, hunted down for thousands of years. 2,000 years. The Jewish people are attacked, persecuted all over the world leading to the Holocaust. The Jewish people come to an understanding the nations don't want us. We are not safe in the nations. We must return to our indigenous land, the land we are from. So the Jewish people, as they came back to Israel, we'll get into that timeline in a moment, they did not want to be a theocracy. They were committed to being a Jewish democratic state. So... You have the Jewish people coming home to the land of Israel. Let's get the Israel map back up for just a moment. Here is this very small country, this very small area, and there's uh, approximately today 9 million, 8 to 9 million Jews and approximately close to 2 million Arabs living in this land. Well, Israel is saying we need our nation to be a Jewish nation. We need one nation on planet Earth where we can speak Hebrew, where we can keep our biblical holidays, where we can serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's go for a moment to the regional map. Let's take a look at the regional map. Look at all the green. Everything you see in green is Muslim territory. These are Islamic nations. This is the state of Israel. So the next time you hear the point, well, just give us more land and you'll have peace. Are you kidding? How much land are we talking here, folks? All of these nations are the Arab Muslim nations. Here is the tiny state of Israel. And remember, I just showed you in the state of Israel, even within that, you've got Gaza and you've got Judea and Samaria. So Israel has a tiny, tiny piece of land that she's holding on to saying, we have to have one place on earth where we as Jews can speak Hebrew, can keep Shabbat, can raise, can raise our children with a strong Jewish identity. And Israel says, listen, we welcome our Israeli Arabs. Now I'm going to do this right here. I want to speak against this ridiculous... Uh, accusation of apartheid. There are close to 2 million Arabs who live within the state of Israel. They have full voting rights. They work in the same offices. They attend the same schools. There are over 14 Arab members of Knesset. Listen to this. There are members of the Muslim Brotherhood who serve in Israel's Knesset. 
members of the Muslim Brotherhood are part of the Parliament of Israel. That's how strong Israel is committed to democratic principles. So this accusation that Israel is an apartheid state is absolute propaganda. There isn't an ounce of truth to it. There is the question of the Palestinian territories and rights for the Palestinians and how that's going to advance. But within the land of Israel, Arab citizens enjoy full rights. There are, there's been Arab members of the Supreme Court. So the accusation of apartheid simply does not have any truth to it whatsoever within the state of Israel. But you see how the media wants to twist it. You see how the media wants to take the plight of the Palestinians and say that's just like the Israeli Arabs. No, it's two completely different people groups. Now, let's go back for a moment uh, to the uh, map of Israel. All right, the map of Israel. We'll take a look at that. So the question becomes Gaza and uh, Judea and Samaria and how the Palestinians advance in that area. Now we're going to go here to Gaza for a moment because this is the site of the conflict. Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005. 2005, Israel withdrew from Gaza and yet here is the war that is upon us today. How did we get here? Well, to do that, what I want to do quickly is I want to go through how we got to where we are today. And we're going to take a little quick journey through history to see how exactly we got here today. We're going to do that with some dates. Let's begin with this. What was the time, what is the date of Jesus' birth? Don't you dare say December 25th. You're more educated than that. What is the date of Jesus' birth? What's the year of Jesus' birth? That's what everybody thinks. Zero. It's incorrect. It is incorrect. Jesus was born probably 3 or 4 B.C. That's the accurate date of Jesus' birth. Most people are not aware of that. But in the early years of the Catholic calendar, there was a mistake in their timing, but they had used it for so long that they didn't want to go and correct it. So Jesus was born three or four years before he was born. Okay, that's the, <laughs> that's the reality of the situation. So we're going to put it at about uh, 4 BC is the birth of Jesus. Coming forward from there, our next important date uh, becomes what? What, what, what? what does anybody want to guess is the next major date in Israel's history past Jesus' birth? What was the cat, cat? There it is. The destruction of the temple. What year? 70 AD. 70 AD is the destruction of the temple. Now, we have to pause and understand that to the Jewish people, the temple is everything. There is no Judaism without the temple. In fact, one could almost say there is no God without the temple because for the Jewish people, the Shekinah, the glory, rested in the temple. So this was a cataclysmic event that should have marked the end of the Jewish people. Uh, we, we then are confronted with the question, oh, listen to me, people, please listen. I say this to pastors everywhere I go. I go into a town, I say, hey, I'm coming to town. Could you take me to a nice Hittite restaurant? Is there a nice Parasite bakery? <laughs> I've really got a hankering for some Amalekite food. Do you have any Amalekite restaurants around? No! Where are these groups? Gone. <sighs> Blown away with the dust of history. Amalekites, Ammonites, Jebusites, Canaanites, Parasites, all of the other ites are gone. Why are the Jewish people still here? Not because they were the biggest. They're a tiny group. Today, there are only about 14 million Jews in the whole world. Folks, would you think about that for a moment? Think about that. There's over a billion Christians, over a billion Muslims, 14 million Jews in the whole world. 
Why are they still here? There is no sociological explanation. There is no human explanation. They are here because we serve a God who keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. We serve a covenant-keeping God who has kept his people Israel. And so AD 70, the temple is destroyed, and for the next 2,000 years, the Jews roam about the earth. They are dispersed to 106 nations of the world. Hebrew ceases to be spoken as a language. Everything that the Jewish people could have held on to and looked to for their identity is lost. And yet, city after city, town after town, what do they do? They keep lighting the Shabbat candles. They keep praying, Shema Yisrael. They keep, they keep bar mitzvahing their sons and they, they, they hold on to the covenants of God. And they keep praying this prayer. They keep praying, but Shana Hababa Yerushalayim, next year we're going to be in Jerusalem. Over and over and over again. For 2,000 years they pray that prayer. Now, the next major date we come to, and this is such an important date, the next major date we come to is 1897. We come to a figure in history, actually two figures in history. We come to a man named Theodore Herzl and a man named William Heckler. Theodore Herzl is a secular Jewish journalist. He is covering what is known as the Dreyfus trial. You can check Wikipedia. We won't get into this, but there's a murder. And the long and short of it is that they pin this murder on a Jew. And it's obvious that he's innocent. Everyone knows he's innocent, but he's the scapegoat. And because of anti-Semitism, they pin this on this Jew. And Theodore Herzl comes to this realization that the Jewish people will never be safe in Europe. That the Jewish people have to return home. Actually, Herzl said they have to go anywhere. They, 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 just, they desperately needed a homeland. This is such an important year. Please do not forget this year. Would you say 1897? 1897. Why is this so important? Because media and the radical left is going to want to say to you that the state of Israel was created as a response to the Holocaust. They're going to want to say that the nations didn't know what to do after the Holocaust and what to do with the Jews, and so they just decided to ship the Jews off to Israel. And that this was a response to the Holocaust. Folks, the Zionist movement started 50 years to 40 years before the Holocaust took place. We have to get this date fixed in our mind. All right? Very, very important date. So, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this story because it's just so fascinating. Theodor Herzl then writes two books. He writes a book called Der Judenstaat, Der Judenstaat, and a book called Alt Neuland. The Jewish State and the Old New Land. And Herzl sets out the vision for the creation of the State of Israel. What does he do? He does Habakkuk 2. Write the vision and make it plain. He writes out the entire vision of the recreation of the state of Israel. Nobody's paying any attention to him. He's a journalist. He works at a small newspaper. He doesn't have a big platform. Nobody knows who he is. He sells his books in these little local bookstores in Vienna, Austria. There is in Vienna, Austria, a prophetic evangelical pastor. This prophetic evangelical pastor has the name William Heckler. William Heckler had been gripped by God through dreams and through prophetic visions. This is in the 1880s. That God spoke to his heart that the rebirth of the Jewish state was going to happen in 1897. When you went into his apartment, it was from ceiling to floor to ceiling, books, maps. 
He would write songs about the recreation of the state of Israel. He was obsessed with the fact that God was going to restore Israel in his lifetime. William Heckler is the evangelical prophetic pastor. Theodore Herzl is the secular, non-believing Jewish journalist. He writes the book. Heckler is walking home from work. He notices a book in the window called The Jewish State. And what he's been praying about and believing for and feels that God has spoken to him, he says, someone has written a book on this. He buys the book. He finds out where Herzl's office is. And the next day, he goes to Herzl's office, knocks on the door. This is all detailed in Herzl's very well-kept diary. Herzl opens the door and he says, in, in front of me stood a figure like Father Abraham. Because Heckler had this long beard. He was this long bearded prophetic looking guy. And William Heckler looked at Theodore Herzl and said, you don't know me, but I know that God has chosen you to bring his people home to the land of Israel and God has sent me to help you make that vision a reality. That began this unlikely friendship between a secular Jewish journalist and a prophetic, wild, evangelical pastor. Why was this important? Because William Heckler, what was his job? He was a pastor, but what else was he? He was the tutor the private tutor to the royal family of Europe. He was in charge of educating the children of the royal family of Europe. So he said to Herzl, I'm going to bring you and introduce you to the Kaiser, to the king, to the duke. I don't know what Kaiser is in English, but duke, prince, count, king, something royal. And so... Heckler brought Herzl. Is this amazing? This is incredible. God works through people. God can work through your life if you just say yes to him. If you just wake up and get involved in his plan. And so Heckler and Herzl go to Kaiser Friedrich's castle. It's in Karlsruhe, Germany. I've been there. They have the first meeting. And the Kaiser says... I think that I'm favorable toward this. I think I'm in support of a creation of a land, a state for the Jewish people. Yeah. And they begin traveling together to all the crowned heads of Europe. They begin going palace to palace, city to city, to all the crowned heads of Europe. And they begin bringing this message. This all leads to our next very important date of 1897, in Basel, Switzerland. This was the First World Zionist Congress. What was the date? 1897. In 1897, Heckler convenes 300 leaders, Jewish leaders from around the world, and he says this in his diary. He says, in Basel, I laid the cornerstone for the creation of the Jewish state. He said, Maybe within five years, but certainly within 50, it will come to pass. What year? 1897. The exact year God had told William Heckler was the restoration of the Jewish people. The exact year that God had told Heckler in a prophecy and a dream that this would come to pass. Folks, you can't make this stuff up. God is speaking in history. Amen. Then, 50 years to the date, we come to this next very important date, and that is 1917. We come to the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration. What is the Balfour Declaration? Well, all of that Middle East territory was under not the colonizing of the Jews, but it was under the British Empire. 
The Ottoman Empire had been defeated. Britain had taken over that entire territory. And as this movement grew for a homeland for the Jews, uh, Lord Balfour in England declared the Balfour Declaration, which stated, uh, His Majesty's government views with favor the creation of a Jewish state in the land of Palestine. This became an incredibly important document as the pathway to legitimacy continued to progress. Why is this so important? Because this narrative that Israel was simply created as a response to the Holocaust is absolutely untrue. These are all facts, clear facts of history that, and I'm only telling you a few of them in this class. We now move forward to our next date, November 29th, 1947. November 29th, 1947. Look at it. 50 years. 50 years. Herzl said, Herzl said, maybe five years, but surely within 50 it shall come to pass. November 29th, 1947 in Queens, New York City, the original site of the United Nations, not where the UN is now, but the original site of the United Nations, you can visit there today. The UN voted together, all the nations of the earth, all, the, beloved, Israel did not invade, Israel did not attack, Israel went through due process. Israel went in front of all the nations of the earth, step by step by step by step. And there was a vote in the United Nations on November 29th, 1947. What was the vote? It was a vote creating two states. A Jewish state of Israel and a state for the Arabs, a state for the Palestinians. The state of Israel, the land mass that they were given, is smaller than what Israel has today. And it did not include Jerusalem. And do you know what the Jews said? Yes. They said yes. It did. To include a homeland for the Jewish people without Jerusalem is like to have a body without a heart. But the Jews said yes, we accept they extended their hands in peace and the Jews were going to have this land and the land of Israel and the Arabs, the Palestinians, were going to have their land and their state. What happened? The Arabs said no. And on May 14th, 1948, six months later, David Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel. And what happened 11 minutes, 11 minutes after David Ben-Gurion uh, signed and declared Israel's statehood? May 14th, 1948, bombs are falling in Tel Aviv. Jerusalem is besieged. Armies are attacking. David Ben-Gurion courageously realizes it's now or never. This is the moment, the existential moment. Can a nation be born in a day? This is what Ben-Gurion is, is understanding, and he boldly de declares the state of Israel. In America, in Washington, D.C., the State Department, the Secretary of State, is speaking to President Harry S. Truman, and they're saying to him, don't you dare support David Ben-Gurion. He's on a suicide mission. The Arabs are going to overrun them in, in a moment, and all of America's oil Reserves, everything, everything that we get from the Arabs is going to, all those contracts, we're going to be ground to a halt. Do not come into support with the state of Israel. What does Harry S. Truman do? He remembers his Sunday school teacher. He remembers his Sunday school teacher who told him that one day the Jewish people would come home. Do you understand the importance of knowing your Bible? Do you understand the importance of understanding the prophetic times we are in? Harry S. Truman remembers his Bible, uh, Bible Sunday school teaching. He picks up his pen. I've actually seen that pen. 
It's at the foreign ministry, the Mizrah Rechutz in Israel. I've seen the pen right there in front of me. He picks up the pen and he says this. He says, I am Cyrus. Who was Cyrus? The Gentile king who stood strong and blessed the people of Israel. He picked up the pen. He said, I am Cyrus. And he signed that America would recognize and support the state of Israel 11 minutes after Israel was born. America has walked in blessing because we have walked with Israel. We've walked with the Jewish people and we must stand with Israel now, today, and forever. David Ben-Gurion declares the state of Israel and what happens? Immediately, five Arab nations attack. Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, five Arab nations well-trained, well-funded, what does Israel have? Israel has about 600,000 people total. Total. Half of them have just come out of the Holocaust. They show up in Israel out of Auschwitz and are given a machine gun to fight for their new land. Can you imagine? Beloved, you want to talk about understanding context? You've got to understand that what the Jews know is that for 2,000 years, no one would allow them to live in peace in their lands. They were persecuted. They were attacked. This is the only sliver of land they have. They were attacked by five Arab armies. David Ben-Gurion stated loudly, clearly, and publicly to the Arabs who were living in the land, he said, we welcome you to live as our friends, our brothers together. We welcome you to live here in peace. And the Arabs who accepted his offer are today Israeli Arabs. They have their passports. They have full voting rights. They're a part of society. They're a part of political parties. There was an Arab Miss Israel. They're television commentators. They're in every aspect of Israeli society. Those who sided with the Arabs invading Arab armies, those Arab armies said, get out of there, run away from there, we're about to come through. And they said, we're going to finish what Hitler started. We're going to drive the Jews into the sea. So leave your homes, leave your towns. So they went to Gaza, they went to different places, get out of your villages, we're going to come through. And guess what? There was a war and they lost. And when you lose a war, there's consequences. There's winners and there's losers. And so to wrap it up as succinctly as I possibly can, what we're dealing with with the Palestinian question is that now you have these people who lost a war. But the radical religious forces want to keep that war going because they're not interested in peace. They're not interested in prosperity for the Palestinians. They are interested in the destruction of the state of Israel. This is the sign of God's covenant through history coming all the way down to 1948. And since 1948, listen to me, there has been war after war after war after war after war. And Israel triumphs every time. And Israel is going to triumph again in this war. Israel is going to win again in this war. And there will probably be more territory gained. And there will probably be more refugees that come out of this war that will create a greater problem. When is, can we put up one more time the regional map and I'll close with this session. The regional map. When are these people in all of these green areas going to realize Israel is not going away? Israel is not disappearing. And why don't they actually get concerned about the couple million, few million Palestinians in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria? They could, there's 50 ways this problem could be solved, but it cannot be solved with hate. It cannot be solved with evil. It cannot be solved with violence. 
And if all you're going to do is teach your children to hate and teach your children jihad and teach your children to scream Allahu Akbar and plan to be suicide bombers, there's not a path forward. This is the reality and the church has to educate themselves on this reality. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week in this strategic emergency update for Israel. God bless you.